All right, welcome back to Wildlife Cake and Cocktails. This is episode 25. We're talking cane toad challenge with Rob Capon. Uh, I'm your host, Yanni Tokola. Unfortunately, we're out in the field uh, running around, so we don't have cocktails this time, but I do have a bottle of water, and I think uh, we're getting a cup of tea over here nice and shortly. <laughs> um, our guest for tonight is Professor Rob Capon. After a PhD in chemistry in 1982 at the University of Western Australia, he's been in various academic and pro professional positions, including a professor of chemistry at the University of Melbourne. He's currently a professorial research fellow and group leader at UQ's Institute for Molecular Biosciences, uh, and we're here to talk Cane toads. Professor Capon, thanks so much for taking the time to, out of your very busy schedule, obviously, to talk to us tonight. Thanks, not, not a problem. No worries. And um, obviously, you're uh, travelling around doing this talk. You've been doing a few already? Yeah, we uh, set up the Cane Toad Challenge about a year and a half ago, and uh, it's had amazing uh, community take up, so everybody wants me to come and talk about it. Yeah, I, I in fact remember hearing about it you know, about a year and a half ago when it was coming out. I was already super, super interested. So, very excited to be able to talk to you. Um, and uh, do you have any more talks coming up after this one here that we're doing with the uh, Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland? I think I've got three or four in my diary. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, guys, so keep a lookout for those. Um, but before we get into it, um, I just want to talk a little bit about chemistry, of course. Um, so you're a uh, natural products chemist, is that correct? That's right. So that's an organic chemist who uh, looks to the world around us as a source of inspiration for molecules that we can use uh, to make our lives better. Uh, it could be medicines, could be agrochemicals, it could be getting rid of cane toads. Excellent, excellent. So basically the identif uh, identification of small naturally produced biologically active molecules, um, aka natural products. That's right. Um, and uh, how and why those products are made and how to apply them to solve scientific and societal challenges, correct? Correct. Excellent, excellent. And uh, you know, it sounds like, a, you know, from what I hear, a very multidisciplinary field, biology, chemistry, microbiology, but a lot of biodiscovery, basically. That's right. So I think you'd find uh, most people would appreciate a, a university has a chemistry department and a, perhaps different types of biology departments. Our institute stands apart from that because we're a multidisciplinary. So I'm a chemist, my colleagues in the same building are all sorts of flavours of biology and bioinformatics and more. So you've got some uh, marine biologists, obviously, there diving around doing marine biodiscovery and uh, things of that nature? Well, that's what we've been doing for the last 30 years as well. So we're not all cane toads. <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, look, we should, um, we should get on to uh, cane toads while we're here. So uh, the invasive uh, cane toad, Ranella marina, uh, produces bufotoxins, which are deadly to all but a couple of Australian predators, um, such as the freshwater snake, uh, also known as the keelback. Um, it's been implicated in declines of uh, many native species which like to um, eat frogs. A lot of our native species are aneurophagus, um, so frog eaters. And uh, these uh, you know, more recently introduced toads, they don't have any immunity against that. So particularly large predators including quolls, crocodiles, monitor lizards, uh, even black snakes have seen sort of shifts in their size and ecology um, and a lot more, um, all uh, seeing declines due to cane, uh, cane toad arrival. Um, so how did you get involved uh, in this project as a natural products uh, chemist? Well, as you, as you noted in your intro, I started out uh, in Melbourne, about 20 years down there, and I came up to Brisbane to join this new institute. And about that time, about 2003, the then government, uh, the Beattie government, um, uh, approached me and asked me whether there was anything that they hadn't considered to get rid of toads, because basically everything they had considered hadn't worked. And had, yeah, they'd been uh, <laughs> trying a lot of different things. Uh, you know, everybody was kind of hoping a natural virus would pop up at some point and start wiping them out, I think, at well, one stage uh, was the wish. I don't know about natural, but uh, <laughs> uh, but no, that, that would be the holy grail, but unfortunately, both at a scientific level and probably at a policy level, it's a problematic one. Yeah, sure. And uh, so what year exactly did you, uh, was that, that they um, started talking to you about the chemistry side of things? So it was about, probably around about 2003, 2004. We got some seed funding to more or less review the current state of the art. And it could be sort of summed up in two basic programs. There was the, the um, hopeful um, biological control, you know, the virus, the bacteria, the whatever. Um, it never panned out. Um, a lot of money was spent on it, but uh, quite frankly, it just didn't go anywhere. Uh, and the other one, which I think the public sort of warmed to, was uh, pick them up and bin them. Um, so the, the physical one, which was to 
uh, pick them up, put them up, get, get rid of them, or to build a fence and send them to somebody else. And there was big efforts in digging trenches and trapping them? And... Yeah, and uh, look, it's like swatting flies. Uh, it, 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 you, you get them off your football field for the, for the week and then uh, they hop back in again out of the surrounding bush, so it's a tricky one. It's a little bit, uh, a bit uh, too little too late for uh, an invasion of uh, this size and such fast reproducers, basically. Uh, yeah, so look, what, what we really needed to think about was a little bit more outside the box, and of course, as a chemist, um, my attention immediately was drawn to chemistry. Um, and the fact that this animal is a problem is because it's poisonous, which is chemistry. So the other question you would ask is, well, why does the toad produce the chemistry in its first place? Why does it produce the poison? And in, does it use it in any particular way that would lend itself to control? So my advice to the government was to invest in chemical ecology-based research. And of course, that was a, you know, a self-serving, I guess, because I, I would do some of the chemical ecology. <laughs> Un unfortunately, uh, uh, the funding was merely there to, to do the stock take and give the advice, and uh, there was never any follow-up funding. So we, we've spent the last 15 years or more um, working on a shoestring uh, with our ecology colleagues in other states uh, trying to battle this problem. And about uh, 2012 we, we came across uh, uh, a pheromonal response that the, the toads uh, use which uh, we eventually developed into a trapping technology. Right, so that's a good seven or eight years of development uh, to find, um, you know, looking at their chemical ecology to uh, mm. find this pheromone. What exactly uh, is uh, this, uh, you know, you're using a fairly innovative uh, natural pheromone that lures the cane toad tadpoles into the, into this uh, new trap design, as yeah. I understand. Yeah. So look, the 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 thing about science is that uh, if you come at it from a multidisciplinary approach, you get the benefits of uh, all of the advantages of the technologies across the disciplines and different ways of thinking and applying what seems like boring average technology in one discipline suddenly becomes um, innovative in another. So the the, the work really stemmed from the observation by the ecologists um, that uh, cane toad tadpoles hunt out uh, the eggs of other females in the same body of water um, and they eat them. They eat those eggs and they do right. this, they, they do this, so this makes them cannibals. Um, you can imagine a number of reasons why they might do it. One would be to knock out genetic competition, you know, I'll get that other female's eggs, they're all gone. Another one could be I'm just hungry and this seems like a good enough thing to eat and I'm immune to the poison so I don't care because uh, the eggs themselves are toxic, the female lays down toxin with them. But the other possibility is that the, the tadpoles themselves are recharging their toxins because at that early stage when they're still tadpoles, they're toxic because of the they, the female laid down toxin with the eggs which was carried through into the tadpoles but they haven't yet learnt how to make the toxin so if they hang around too long they become less and less and less toxic it's only when they metamorphose and they become little toadlets that suddenly the, the parotid gland appears on their shoulders and you're off mate and they become toxic again so until they're toadlets with the parotid glands, they're bioaccumulating the bufotoxin from what they're we're, eating? We're not quite sure. I mean, it's very hard to ask the tadpoles what they're doing. I mean, we're, <laughs> just, we're just trying to second guess as to why they would rush around and try to eat these, uh, these eggs. But the key observation was that even in very disturbed water, where there is no ability to do a visual um, hunt, uh, the tadpoles are very effective at hunting down and finding the eggs. So the, the thought was there must have been a chemical being released by the eggs that the tadpoles were homing in on. And we just spent several years studying every aspect of the cane toad chemistry. So the two observations were timely. We put our knowledge of cane toad chemistry together with the ecologist's understanding of the behaviour and we came to the realisation what the actual chemical was that was attracting the tadpoles. Once you know what the attractant is, you can then put it onto a uh, bait. You can put the bait into a box with a hole in the side, a funnel, funnel trap, and it sends out a chemical signal. The tadpoles that are swimming around in the body of water think that the mother load of eggs is at the end of that big signal. They swim into the box. Hey, there's no eggs, but now they're in the box and to swim out is too much trouble, and so you can get rid of them that way. Yeah, wow. So um, there must have been quite a, a bit of development to getting it to that stage where it's, uh, uh, I guess, ready to go on the traps. But I do understand that you can uh, basically just throw some parotid glands in there as well and you'll get some success, yeah. but uh, not the same degree as you will get with, um, with the uh, trapping product that you guys have produced at IMB. Yeah, so look, the, you're right. The, the, uh, when we did the original science, we, we did two things. We, we published it so that everybody would know about it. And before we published it, we patented it. And we were issued a, 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 a full patent, um, which is still valid today, and we've now licensed that patent to a pest control company. And that 
gives that company the certainty to invest many hundreds of thousands of dollars to put a product on the shelves. So without the patent, we would have probably never in encouraged an investor to step in. But once we published as well, um, the public then picked up on this and so yes they started to chop off product gland and stick them into into traps and it does work <laughs> after a fashion and and that was the original observation uh, that the way that the ecologists tested the theory by using the product glands the problem is that the gland uh, a cut-off gland is meat and so you're putting two signals you're putting a chemical signal and you're putting a dead meat signal and a dead meat signal isn't species specific whereas the chemical signal is species specific. So we want the chemical signal without the smell of meat. Absolutely, to, uh, to avoid bycatch, which um, I, I, I hear that um, the, uh, the pheromone that you're using, um, because it is basically a cane toad product, it is also quite, uh, well, it's definitely not attracting a lot of native stuff. I hear there's a very small amount of bycatch and a huge proportion of cane toad tadpoles going into these traps. Yeah, it's, it, it, to all intents and purposes, it appears to be species specific. Obviously, um, random animals uh, swimming around are going to swim into, uh, into a trap just by virtue of the fact that there's a hole in a box and they'll swim in. Um, some of the lab experiments that were done by the ecologists uh, uh, looked uh, to indicate that uh, native frog tadpoles were actually repelled uh, by the scent rather than attracted to, which is good. Which is very, very important. Obviously, if you're uh, putting a, a uh, amphibian tadpole trap into a water body, you don't want to be uh, no. accidentally taking some natives along with it. No, absolutely. It would defeat the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> very much so, very much. All right, well, look, so um, you guys have been developing this thing for a few, uh, for a few years now. You, uh, mm -hmm. You're taking the Kanto Challenge on the road for about a year and a half already. Um, can you tell us about the Kanto Challenge and the uh, sort of community engagement and uh, citizen science effort that you guys currently have done? Yeah, so the, the order of events was uh, try to find an industry partner who would take up our patent and invest to make a commercial product. Obviously, if there's a commercial product, it makes life easy for everybody. You go to the shop, you buy the product, and you use it. Um, and that's much easier than us having to do it in our laboratory. Uh, the trouble was, it took a long time to find an industry partner. We searched Australia high and, high and long, and, and really without much success. And our partner is actually a US-based company outside of uh, Seattle. Uh, so um, the trouble is that they, the company uh, indicated it would take several years to go through all of the regulatory requirements. The, uh, optimization for manufacture, marketing, distribution. So, you know, that was yet another delay. We'd already waited four or five years. We didn't want to wait another three or four years. So after we licensed the, the, the patent to the company, um, I had a conversation with them and said, what do you think about the idea of us uh, making the debates in the lab at the university and giving them away free until such time as you have a commercial product on the market? And they thought that was a fantastic idea because it would build um, product recognition, give us a chance to test run a few ideas about how to optimise the trap, get the public on side. So the Cane Toad Challenge was really set up as an interim measure between uh, how uh, to fill that void between you know getting it commercialized or having an idea to get it commercialized and actually delivering on that. Right. So the Kanto Challenge has been running for how long now? Oh, I think it's uh, it seems like forever, but it's, <laughs> it's not forever. Uh, it's probably about a year, year and a half tops. So so uh, it's uh, it's a website. Uh, it's me at the University of Queensland uh, and it's our whole swag of volunteers who sign on uh, as affiliates. So we have at the moment over 50 organisations that have signed on. Some are small, some are little community groups with 35 people who just want to do good things. Some are schools, golf clubs, uh, Dreamworld is another one that signed on, so bigger companies. We have a lot of the uh, regional councils starting from New South Wales with uh, Tweedshire right the way through, Bundaberg, got Ipswich and more recently we had um, um, Brisbane City Council come on board which was fantastic because obviously that's a huge uh, population base that they draw on. So we're really excited about uh, getting the councils on board because they have people in the field which I don't have to pay for which is fantastic. Uh, they make their own traps, uh, they deploy the traps um, they get rid of the tadpoles when they've caught them and our job is simplified we just make the baits and make sure they have a good supply. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well look it's great to see so much community engagement obviously you know everybody loves uh, you know our native amphibians and all of our native species you know some of the bigger meso predators and larger predators that are at risk from these cantos. What do you think it, uh, it is about this project that people are so keen to get behind? 
they hate toads. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> they're in your yard, they're in your dog's bowl, they're on the roads, they're everywhere. They know they're killing wildlife, they don't like them, they want to get rid of them. There was one in my, um, in my chicken's water dish this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they are absolutely everywhere and uh, look not just a risk to uh, native wildlife but to pets as well they um they are a bit of a menace aren't they they are and uh, as i've been doing this uh, cane toad challenge and talking with uh, people out there in the community it's become more apparent to me just how big a menace they are for example i didn't realize that they were a threat to the cattle industry well who would have thought how, how does uh, that come about? Well, it comes about because the uh, 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 cattle are subject to uh, parasites like uh, buffalo fly. Oh, buffalo no, fly breed in cow pets. Uh, the dung beetles were imported to get rid of the cow pets. The cane toads like to sit in a cow pet and eat the dung beetles. And so the cane toads are mopping up the farmer's dung beetles and thereby making it more likely to have uh, fly strike in their, in their wild livestock. So. Who would, have, who would have guessed? Yeah, wow, that's uh, fascinating. Just uh, that uh, removal of dung beetles. And it does make sense that in those long fields, a nice cow pat makes a, a flat open area for a fat cane toad to sit and wait for all the uh, bugs and insects and flies to come to. They're also a huge problem in the um, um, market garden industry because it's a, it's a, uh, a biocontrol problem, it's a biosecurity problem. So if you're harvesting lettuce and you get little toadlets about the size of your thumbnail and they jump between the letter leaves of your cos, uh. and then they get picked and they get shoved through your machine, um, put into little bags at Woolies or Coles, and you have a little toad in there. That's not a good look. Uh, if they're shipped interstate to the big um, centralised marketing hubs, then you've uh, shipped a, a, a foreign critter to another jurisdiction. You're in big trouble for that. Uh, so the farmers have got a, a, a serious problem on their hand. It's not a problem of poisoning animals or not a problem of poisoning people. It's a problem of uh, degrading their product and also uh, causing them to come foul of government regulations. Wow, so another reason for us to uh, get involved in the Cane Toad Challenge as absolutely. soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. No worries. Uh, Professor Rob Capon, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us tonight. Um, okay. Now people can obviously find uh, the Cane Toad Challenge if they just Google Cane Toad Challenge, is that correct? Cane Toad Challenge, one word, will get you there. Um, and uh, from our website, we have links to various video clips and we have a number of resources you can download. And if you're really interested, uh, you can uh, register to be a member. No worries, no worries. And uh, you can also check out the Institute of Molecular Biosciences at uq at imb.uq.edu um, and yeah, forward slash Cane Toad Challenge to get to the Cane Toad Challenge there as well. Thank you so much to the Wildlife Preservation Society of Queensland for uh, putting this event on as well. You can see them at wildlife.org.au or on their fantastic uh, Facebook page. That's the uh, Brisbane branch of the Wildlife Pre Preservation Society of Queensland at Facebook at uh, Wildlife Queensland. Um, Thanks again so much. I uh, can't wait to uh, hear your talk tonight. And uh, you've got a few more coming up? I have a lot more coming up. And of course, on your way home, keep an eye out for toads. <laughs> and uh, don't swerve too far, but you know, they squish nicely too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No worries, guys. That's been Professor Rob Capon. I'm your host, Gianni Tocola. And uh, plenty more wildlife cake and cocktails on the way soon. Thanks, guys. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks very much. And uh, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Thanks for coming out on such a muggy evening. It's lovely to be living in Brisbane, isn't it? Um, what I'd like to do over the next uh, 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so, is to just give you a, a, a glimpse into a world that I sort of work in, which is that of science, but it's also uh, the world of cane toads. And I should say at the outset, I'm really quite uh, receptive to any questions, so as I go through, if you've got a question, just indicate, wave your arms or something. Oh, now I can't see you, but that'll be okay. <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, you'll just have to wave more vigorously so that I can see you. Um, and, uh, and we'll just let it, uh, uh, we'll let the evening flow um, as, as you uh, wish to ask questions. So, the first thing I should say, or probably I don't need to say, is we all understand the cane toad's a problem. Um, uh, some of us have perhaps uh, lived here longer and have seen the damage over time. Um, those who are unfortunate enough to uh, uh, be experiencing at the invasion front, which at the moment is over in Western Australia, uh, the, perhaps the damage is more dramatic because you have naive native predatory species who first encounter cane toads as the toads march west 
Uh, they're biologically programmed to march west, which means it was a dumb move to put them in the top east corner of Australia, because it meant that they, over the next 100 years they would just march right across the continent. So they're a huge problem across Australia. Here in Brisbane, we've sort of become a little bit... Uh, How's that? Better? So I guess we've sort of become a bit used to them, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to get rid of them. So, who are we and where are we? So, um, uh, as uh, was mentioned in the introduction, uh, I'm a university academic, I'm a professorial research fellow, which is just a fancy way of saying I don't teach undergraduate students. Um, so I lead a research team that occupies this very nice building here, uh, which is the Queensland Bioscience Precinct. So we're about... Uh, one quarter of the top floor of this building here. So I think when you think about uh, um, research involving the wildlife, you sort of think of the, 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 the khaki scientists, and we've got a khaki person right in the front here. All right, so this, this is what an ecologist looks like. <laughs> This is what a chemist looks like, or a biologist, or a microbiologist, or the sorts of people that I deal with. So we're the laboratory-bound people, which means that in order for us to make a reasonable contribution to the real world of ecology, we need to team up with ecologists, which we do. Now, jump straight into the problem. Um, in the top corner up here, this is uh, uh, an analysis that we would do in the lab to uh, identify all of the chemical components in a toxin. So we take the eggs, we extract them with an organic solvent, we analyse them through a very expensive machine. Every peak with a number on it represents a different chemical. Um, they all belong to the same broad structure class. What that means is that eggs are toxic, but they don't have a single toxin. And that's very clever because if you have to protect yourself from multiple species, it could be that some species acquire a degree of resistance to a chemical. But if you have 10 versions of that chemical, it's harder for them to develop a level of resistance to all 10 of them. And so by having a cocktail of toxic, uh, toxic chemistry, uh, the toad is a sort of uh, ensuring that it's got the broadest spectrum of, of, of uh, evil doing, of killing, species uh, as it can. So the eggs are very toxic. Now I'm not going to talk about that in any great detail, it's up at the top of the screen for each of the next few slides as I go through the different life stages of the toad and all I'd ask you to note is it's not the same. So the eggs are toxic because they have chemicals in them that make them toxic but if we have a look at the tadpoles they have a different blend of toxin. Why? because the predator species that are a problem for the tadpoles are not necessarily the same predator species that are a problem for the eggs. So this is a highly evolved system. This is not just some dumb toxin shoved into a sack, killing anything that comes near it. As the animal moves through its life stages, it recalibrates its toxin to make it more relevant to the situation that each life phase has to deal with. Um, and the tadpoles are toxic. So if you're a small critter and you take on a couple of tadpoles, you're going to get uh, poisoned. If we move up to the adult toads, they're different again. And in fact, this is a really interesting issue, um, which I'll come back to later in the talk. Um, cane toad toxin was studied in the 1970s. And when we came into the story, it was in 2004, with some support from the Queensland Government when I moved my research group from Melbourne up to the University of Queensland. We were asked to have a look at the cane toad issue and we decided to have a look at cane toad toxin. It had already been done 30 or 40, 50 years earlier. But actually it hadn't been done as it turns out and I'll reveal to you today that what's actually in the textbooks or is in the primary literature about cane toad toxin um, skims across the surface and misses the elegance of what the cane toad is actually doing with its toxin. 
Part of that is, is illustrated in the fact that there is a variety of chemical components as you move through the life stage. That's already a, a warning to us that says something's going on here, these toads are pretty clever. They, they know what they're doing, even the difference between an egg and a tadpole and an adult. But let's keep going, even a dead toad is toxic. And that's a dead adult, that's a live adult, or lots of live adults. That chemistry is different to that chemistry. Go figure. How on earth can a dead toad change its toxic composition from a live toad? That's sort of, ooh, it's a voodoo, you know, that, that's not right. It is right. Um, it turns out that when the toad gets run over by your car, about six to eight hours later, it's a hundred times more toxic than it was before you ran it over. How good is that? So um, if you think the baked toad on the road isn't going to be toxic, I had a German visiting student that came to my lab, little did he know what he was going to be doing. Um, we went out and we collected four fresh roadkill toads, we put them in lunch boxes in the lab and we let them rot for a month. And his job was to test the chemical composition of the toxin every day over a month. And we figured it would more or less go downhill because as it rotted away, it would sort of degrade away. The toxin stayed static the whole time. So a dead toad on the road, well, this was a dead toad on the bench in the lab, so perhaps it's not baked in the Brisbane sun, uh, but it was still um, uh, an interesting observation. So dead toads are bad. Toads kill all these critters and more. Um, uh, the basic problem that we have in Australia is that being an island, um, we didn't have toads. The toads were introduced in the 1930s uh, to control a beetle in the sugarcane uh, industry. Uh, they didn't actually do any good for that beetle. Uh, they just were really good at breeding. Um, and so we ended up with lots of toads and beetles in the sugarcane. The, the sugarcane problem was eventually controlled by synthetic um, insecticides, uh, but the damage was done. We already had the cane toads. From a hundred odd toads, we've now got goodness knows how many. It's certainly in the uh, tens, hundreds, perhaps even more of millions of, of toads out there. But our native predator species haven't had the time to evolve the resistance to the toxin. So they just see a toad hopping by and they think, yummy, that's, that's, that's food. And one of the problems with an animal like a toad is you have very small life stages which are capable of poisoning small predators and the bigger adults are capable of poisoning uh, big predators. So you have animals like crocodiles who will be killed from adult toads and you have small planigales and other um, uh, smaller marsupials who are suffering uh, with the small toadlets about the size of your fi little fingernail. Not only do they get the, um, the native animals, uh, but they also get pets. And uh, um, I have uh, friends who are vets and they say that every year there's a steady stream of owners bringing in their pet dog which has taken on a toad and come off worse for wear. Um, the, the toads are essentially a ball with legs. I mean, what self-respecting dog could avoid that? Um, so, uh, a lot of problems. Cats, on the other hand, smart enough. They, 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 they seem to leave the, the toads alone. Oops, we've lost a picture. Let me, hopefully it comes back. Oh no. All right. Well, let me tell you the picture you would have seen there if you'd seen it there. It's a picture of a, of a cow pat full of dung beetles. And the reason it's there is because dung beetles are our friend. They're the biocontrol that actually works. That's what the toad was supposed to be, but the toad wasn't. The dung beetle is a good, was a good success story because it was brought in to bury dung. In South Africa, a um, lot of herbivores, a lot of um, pats on the ground, whether it's from big animals, giraffes, hippopotamus, elephant, take your pick, lots of it and the dung beetle buries it in the ground, and that has some advantages. In Australia, where you are um, uh, farming large numbers of cattle, the cattle pat hits the ground, bakes solid, and it's essentially like sticking a dustbin lid on the ground. Now, if you're a farmer growing a pasture to be eaten by your livestock, you don't want a pasture that has got dustbin lids all over the place. 
So dried out cow pats are preventing the grass, the pasture from growing. Worse than that, uh, when they're um, still fresh or they get wet, uh, they represent a lovely habitat for parasites to live in, uh, particularly the buffalo fly. And as the larvae progress through their lifestyle and hatch out as flies, they then sit on the backs of, of livestock and although you're missing the lovely picture of the cattle, um, here's the back of an animal covered in buffalo fly. And that causes, um, causes problems to the, uh, uh, to the animal, it makes them unwell, and of course for the farmer who's trying to protect their livestock, uh, that becomes uh, an expense. So how does the, the cane toad interfere with this? Well, the cane toad sits in the cow pat and eats the, the dung beetles. So you can take a, a cane toad out of a cow pat, open it up and find 50 dung beetles in it. At this stage, the farmers are still buying their dung beetles from the local store and releasing them in their pastures. So that's like feeding cane toads, which isn't really on. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock to me because I hadn't appreciated that cane toads hurt cattle. It's not direct, but it certainly is a real impact nevertheless. Okay. So fortunately, we're out of the snow and we're back into real black and white, or back uh, colour. So uh, cane toads are clearly a, a problem. They're toxic. They're unpleasant. Um, they're one of those animals that people just instinctively don't like. And regrettably, that has uh, led to some behaviour which is less than ideal, where it seems to be, in some people's minds, OK to beat the hell out of a cane toad and there's no end of stories from childhood experiences with golf clubs and two by fours and bricks and anything else. So I guess my, one of my take home messages for today would be to alert you to the fact that the damage that the cane toad does in Australia is not of the cane toad's making, it's actually the victim in this. We brought it here and it is not attacking our wildlife, it's our wildlife that are attacking it. So it's being mugged by our wildlife and it's defending itself and it's killing our wildlife. So um, we don't want it here. We need to get rid of it, but we need to do it in a humane fashion. All right, so let's get down to the science. There's the toad. You all know about, probably know about the protoid gland. It's a lumpy bulge on the shoulder of the toad, on both shoulders, uh, and it's where the bulk of the toxin is made and stored. Uh, there are actually little versions of it. You can see them all over the toad. The toad is very warty. Each of those is a gland. Each one of those contains toxin, um, but tiny, tiny amounts. So if you wanted to see the toxin, what you would do is you would squeeze the toad, you'd hold it, apply a bit of pressure to it, and the milky secretion would come out. If you're clever enough and you figure out how to do it, and you can get a little micro drop out of these guys too, but it's more trouble than it's worth. Uh, this is where the bulk of it is. So on a typical toad around Brisbane, about yay big, um, somewhere around about 200 milligrams of uh, toxin uh, is inside the two glands. That toxin, no matter what you read on, on Google, um, which is the web is full of great stuff, it's full of rubbish too, um, Toads will not look you in the eye and squirt you from three metres away, all right? They are not a cobra. Um, they do not have venom. Venom is something that uh, you normally associate with fangs and the like and, and, and attacking. This, a toad is toxic like an oleander is toxic. No one thinks of an oleander as about to mug you in the street and, and poison you and, and with venom. Um, a toad is not venomous, it is poisonous. That said, it's very poisonous. Now, if we were to uh, kill the toad humanely, and uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, controversy about what is the humane way to kill a toad, I would uh, strongly encourage you not to use any chemical method to kill a toad. So there's a product that was on the market for a very short period of time called Hopstop. Stay away from it like the plague. Uh, it is Dettol in a spray can, um, and it's anything but humane. Uh, and it's certainly not species specific. If you want to kill an adult toad, cool it so that it goes comatose and then freeze it. Now, for a while there, there was some suggestion that that was not humane, 
because some um, ill-informed person made a casual remark that they thought crystals would form in the tissue and this would elicit pain. They had no evidence for this, they just said it over a cup of coffee and they must have been believed because forever and a day, uh, RSPCA and everybody else were saying you must not freeze to, to kill. Uh, a couple of years ago, one of my colleagues, an ecologist, smart enough to team up with neuroscientists, uh, they strapped a cane toad to a table, stuck on all of the wires, measured its brain waves, yes, it has a brain, um, measured, its, measured its pain response and put it through the cool freeze cycle and saw absolutely zilch. All right, so the cool freeze does not cause pain. It's a great big myth and it's probably, the biggest problem with that being a myth is it stopped people from using it thinking they were doing the right thing and they went ahead and they used less appropriate methods. Uh, please, unless you're very, very skilled, decapitation is not uh, to be recommended. You'll take off your fingers. Um, there's some suggestion you should just belt them on the head with a hammer. Look where the parotid gland is. I told you that this thing won't squirt at you deliberately, but I promise you if you whack it on the head with a hammer, you're going to get an eyeful of, of, of poison. It's just a fact of life. It comes out when predators apply pressure to the gland. It's a compression release system, so whacking it on the head if you're a little bit off centre uh, will lead to a spray of toxin. <laughs> if you kill the toad and cut off the gland, it looks something like that. If you flip it upside down and look at the other side, Hey, it's full of corn. Um, these are little circular little vesicles. Each one's about a fraction of a millimetre across. Typical toad around here, somewhere between 80 and 120 of these little um, circular um, beads. That's where the toxin is stored, inside those beads. If we zoom in on one of those beads, one of those little droplets, there it is there, we just zoom in on that guy. That's its expanded view. You can see it's vascularized. It's a structure that has a blood supply going to the surface. That's to keep it nutrients going in and waste material coming out. So it's quite sophisticated. It's got a duct. This is where the duct would have been. It got cut off when we did the dissection. And that duct would have gone to the surface of the, of the, of the toad. The, the skin. So all 80 to 120 of those little vesicles is connected to the surface by a little tube. So now you start to get a sense of how the toxin is released. When you apply pressure, it's a hydrostatic compression of that little bead pushing the contents up through the duct and that's why, if we go back a slide, you get these little droplets forming because they're coming out of all of the pits and it's the bottom of these little black dots where the exhalant ducts are for all those beads. And you can probably almost count them and sort of see there's more than one per little black dot because uh, adjacent uh, ducts all sort of converge on the same place. So the toxin is compartmentalised and it's in a delivery system that is driven by compression. If I squeeze a toad, like I've done here, you get about 50% of the toxin out, but you can't get the rest out, which is real painful because we want the toxin. So if we've got a toad, we're going, ah, get the last bit out, can't do it. Have to kill it and cut it off and extract it to get the last bit out. Uh, the reason for that is if a toad was to release all of its toxin during a predatory attack, it would be vulnerable if it did survive to the very next predatory attack. Now, after you've squeezed, the reason why you can't get it all out is because you've essentially deflated a good about 50% of those little droplet shaped devices in there and you can't get purchase on the remaining ones that are left. Imagine if you put eggs into a football and you squeezed it to break the eggs, you wouldn't be able to get the last one, it's not unless you've got super strong hands because the football's leathery thing and you just can't press in to get to the last ones. You can only break the ones that you do because they're all leaning up against each other and they're applying pressure. After a couple of days, the deflated vesicles reinflate with blood, not toxin. It takes a month for the toxin to be re-synthesized uh, and reloaded. So an emptied vesicle doesn't go back to a full vesicle for at least four weeks. But they fill with blood because the blood resets the hydrostatics of the system and then another predator comes along and attacks and you get about 50% of the toxin out 
but half of it is blood and half of it is toxin, so you still get about 25%. But each time you do that, you're still getting way, way more than you need in terms of toxin uh, to be um, effective against a predator. All right, so that's interesting. Now, if we were to take that, uh, that uh, structure and we were to slice it fine and put it under a microscope and have a look at it, and this is one of the advantages. As a chemist, I don't actually have microscopes like this in my lab, but I'm in an institute full of people who do. So we just stroll down the corridor and say, hey, let's have a look at a toad chopped up. So this is a very fine cross-section. These are these yellow uh, vesicles lined up here. They're all alongside each other. This is the outside world. This is the skin of the toad. This green stuff has been dyed. It's the connective tissue, the muscle. And so you're looking at that sort of very narrow interface between the inside where the, the vesicles are and the outside. Here's a channel. This is one of the ducts to the surface, one of those black pits, and this would have led back to, a, to this particular vesicle. And if you squeeze, the contents of this would ooze out through here. So one of the things that we learnt when we went to look at the, the chemistry of the toad is that, I, I think I mentioned earlier, um, the, the literature, the textbooks, have a particular definition of what the chemistry of a toad toxin is. And that was predicated on researchers squeezing a toad and studying the chemistry that squeezed out. And that seems perfectly logical. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Except for one thing. The chemistry that is stored inside the toad is different to the chemistry that, that you get outside the toad. Because when you squeeze that, it passes through that duct and it passes through past these little granular nodules here and they contain an enzyme and that enzyme is co-secreted with the toxin and within 10 minutes of being secreted it has chemically transformed the toxin into something that's 100 times more potent. So the toad stores its toxin in a deactivated version which nobody knew about and when you squeeze it out it throws in this enzyme to get it going. Doesn't want it. It's like, I don't want to store the nuclear warheads in the kitchen, please. You know, uh, or if we store the rifle, can we please have the ammunition in that drawer and the rifle in that cupboard over there? And then when you push it out, load it. So as the toad squeezes it out, it loads the toxin by enzymatically changing its chemical structure. We know this because we have dissected out and studied the toxin in the vesicles. We've studied the toxin outside. We've isolated the genetic material that codes for the enzyme. We've isolated the enzyme, and we've studied the effect of the enzyme, and so we know a great deal about this relationship here. Now, up to this point, I haven't mentioned anything about cane toad control, because we went in simply in a basic science thing saying, do we really know about the chemical composition of the toad? and how it uses toxins and makes toxins and stores toxins. Well, what happens when the cane toad dies? How does the toxin change? Ah, so the live toad is full of the deactivated one. When your car tire runs over the toad, it mixes this with this, and everything gets set to the super toxic version. That's what happens. So um, it's a bit like, uh, uh, well, it's, it's pretty brutal. <laughs> I don't know. It's, the, it's the ultimate predator is the four-wheel drive. So, um, uh, so, so uh, this was really nice basic science, understanding how it all worked, but how does it relate to an ecology solution? So while well, we're Beaver and Way in the labs try to understand these fundamental principles about a toad, our ecology colleagues are out there poking snakes and lizards and toads in the bush, having a great old time, um, and saying, gee, look at that toad there, look at that one there, look at that one there, and then we come together and we have a conversation. Um, uh, they struggle, perhaps, to understand what I'm talking about, about the chemical structure of here, um, but I'd like to think that I can figure out what they're talking about with behaviour. Yeah. No, there's, there's, there's... Is that the reason why it, what if it got injured itself and had a yeah. cut and it released it? 
So look, there's a, there's a number of possible explanations and, and it's possible that more than one is right. That's certainly one of them. Another one is that the chemical structure that's in those vesicles um, is of a particular form that allows what we call micelles to form. So it actually allows the toxin to form droplets which make it easier to flow. So there's a physical chemistry element to it, that's one. But there's another really interesting side story. We've isolated bacteria that live inside the parotid gland of the toad. And there are two basic groups of bacteria that we've isolated from the toad, gram-positive and gram-negative, and several strains of each. One group is capable of degrading, eating, using as its carbon source, the activated toxin. So when a toad is attacked and the toxin is squeezed out through the duct and it's activated by the enzyme, some of the toxin will actually spill back into the tissue and with the enzyme spilled back into the tissue and will make the much more potent toxin loose in the toad. Those bacteria are the hazmat team. They clean it up. Those bacteria cannot degrade the stored toxin. So the toad makes its toxin immune to these bacteria by storing it in this deactivated version. And when it's accidentally spills some into its own tissue, those bacteria run around and clean up the mess. So what I was saying about a sophisticated system, this is a system that involves enzymes, toxins, protoxins, it involves bacteria. Now there's another group of bacteria in there and they're really cool too. What they do, they appear to change the chemical structure of the toxin to make it look more like what ends up in the eggs. So the female puts a different version of the toxin in the eggs. Why does it have to be chemically different? Because it's in an aquatic environment, so they have to make it less water soluble, because it'll wash away. And the types of predators that the eggs encounter are completely different to the types of predators that the adult encounters. So from an evolutionary perspective, the toad has learnt not to give the eggs adult toxin because it's not as efficient, but to transform it into egg toxin. And the bacteria do that job for the toad. So there's all sorts of reasons why they, and those bacteria will not touch the stored toxin. So all the way along that stored toxin is not as toxic to the toad, and it's also not prone to bacterial transformation or degradation. Really cool stuff. So how does all of that lead to cane toad control? Or it doesn't, until you talk to people who see toads in the real world. So here's what, here's what my, my khaki colleagues tell me. They say, it's really cool, they're out there looking at all these tadpoles in a dirty body of water, and the, uh, when eggs hatch out, you don't get a few cane toad tadpoles, you get masses of them. So you get, you know, three, four, five thousand tadpoles swimming around in a great big swarm. And they seem to go out on a mission to hunt out and find the eggs of another female. So the first female's eggs hatch out, they're all brothers and sisters, and they're off on a mission. And one of those missions is to stay alive, and another one of them is to make sure that the other female's eggs don't stay alive. So they hunt them out and they eat them. Now, there's a number of reasons you could hypothesize why those tadpoles would eat those eggs. One is they're hungry, and, you know, eggs food, that's good. Um, another possibility is that they don't want genetic competition. They don't want a whole bunch of offspring from another female competing for resources in their pond. And so they're going to go polish them off while they can. And as eggs, they're much easier to, to fight off. And another possibility is that the Tadpoles themselves are replenishing their toxin reserves. The, the tadpoles don't have a parotid gland and they don't know how to make the toxin. They're toxic because the female laid it in the eggs and the eggs carried through the toxin into the tadpoles. But if the tadpoles hang around too long as they become late stage tadpoles, they actually get less and less toxic until they metamorphose and then they start to produce toxin. Uh, and now they're little toads and they're toxic. With one caveat, a colleague of mine in Europe carried out an experiment where he took the toads, 
tadpoles, and sure enough, they get progressively less toxic, he exposed them to predators. When the tadpoles are exposed to predators, all bets are off, they become toxic immediately. So they know how to turn on toxin production prematurely when the need arises. So again, it's, it's, it's a complicated uh, uh, system, which is just amazing. So this is what uh, Rick and his team observed. The tadpoles hunt out the eggs and go, mm, yum, yum, I'll have that, and they eat it. This happens in very dirty water, where the tadpoles can't possibly see the eggs, but they still manage to find them. And so they came to us and they said, hey, is it possible that there's a chemical cue that the eggs are releasing, which is acting as a tractant to the tadpoles, and could you work out what that chemical is? If you could, you could put the chemical on a bait, stand it in a box of, called a funnel trap, where you drill a hole in the box and you attach a funnel, and the tadpoles will swing by and go, oh, I can smell that big pile of eggs, thank you very much. Hang on a sec, this isn't what I expected. But now they're inside the box, and it's harder to get outside the box because the funnel out is smaller than the funnel in. And besides, there's nothing to force them to go out, so they hang around in there. So that's the basis of the trapping technology that we co-developed with our ecology colleagues, um, and we worked out what the chemistry was. So what is the chemistry that's on that? It's the toxin in the eggs. So it's one, of, one or two of the whistling here. So it's the, the, the chemistry, some of the chemistry that's in the eggs that's responsible for them being toxic, which is laid down by the adult. Now that's great, except we wanted to make thousands of baits. And this meant running around and catching huge sackfuls of eggs. And that's not the easiest thing to do. They're not as obvious as the tadpoles, and, and you don't get very much from a bunch of eggs because it's very, very efficient. This pheromone, this chemical that's released, is incredibly effective at attracting the tadpoles, so they don't need very much of it. But because we had spent several years studying the inside out of tadpole, uh, pantotoxin, we learned how to process dead toads into the attractant chemical that is found in the eggs. So now we take a whole bunch of dead toads, take them into the lab, we use that enzyme that I told you about, and we use that to help us push the chemistry into the form it needs to be, and then we load it onto our baits. And so now we make baits, 25 baits to a bottle. They'll store indefinitely in the glove box of your car. Um, these are um, uh, air stones, so if you've got an aquarium, you go to the aquarium shop and you buy a little ceramic or glass uh, a highly porous stone that you bubble air through to help keep your fish tank uh, uh, performing well. Uh, we, we buy those at about $100 for 5,000 of them. Um, we soak them in a precise amount of the chemistry which is required, put a little bit of food colouring on there to know that we've done it, dry them, load them into these, and we've given away about 5,000 baits, which is many hundreds of, of these bottles this summer alone. And people put these into traps that they make. So how does it work? How do you make baits? Well, that's how you make baits. You, you, you come to us. Uh, you have to have a liberal amount of dead toads. So this is like some sort of witch's brew. Yes, uh, eye of newt. No, no, just bucket of dead toads, please. Um, and we actually don't want the dead toad. We just want the parotid gland. So we've set up a structure where certain of our partners can deliver dead toads to us, but we only get them to deliver us the parotid glands because we don't want all the rest of the toad. It's too icky. Leave that to someone else. Once you've got a whole bunch of dead toads, um, there's a picture missing there. It would be a picture of my postdoc, Angela. Go find a chemist, all right? Because we need to have somebody who knows what they're doing in the lab uh, to extract out the chemistry, to make, to, to analyze it, to make sure it's got the right chemical composition, to calibrate it so we put precisely the right amount on there. We don't want to put too much, we don't want to put too little, um, and away we go. Well, hopefully we haven't got too many more white ones. All right, so how do you make um, a, um, a trap? So I thought I'd, the easiest way is to just show you how to make a trap. So I went to Officeworks on the weekend, and for $20, 
you can get four of those with lids. That's about right. So the trap is a, is a funnel trap and it has to stand in the shallow water of a water body that's got tadpoles in it. You want it to stand on the bottom along the bank because the tadpoles congregate around the edges of a water body. No point floating it out in the middle of a dam. That's not where the tadpoles are. They're over near the bank where they're trying to find food. Um, you cut a hole in each end and you put a funnel in it and you put the bait in here and a chemical trail comes out both directions. And this sits in the shallows and one funnel points in one direction around the bank, the other points in the other direction, so you're sending a signal in both directions. If you point it this way, one goes out to the middle where there's no tadpoles and one goes up onto the shore where there's definitely no tadpoles. That's a bit useless. I'll do it that way. How do you cut the hole in the side? Well, um, first of all, you need a funnel. If you go to Coles or Woolies, you can buy these sorts of funnels in packs of three or four for about three dollars. Or you can buy these sorts of funnels in packs of four or five for about five dollars. Um, and they work okay. Cutting a hole in the side of a box like that looks a bit tricky. Um, but if you go to my next favourite store, which is Bunnings, you can be cheap and get the, the toy tools, not the real tools, because the real tools cost a lot of money. So this is a, this is a kit. This costs $19.95. It's got all of these big circular saw blades. And what you do is you find a saw blade that fits your funnel. And it needs to just be a little bit smaller than the funnel. You put it on the end of your drill. Zip, takes two seconds to go through. So I made this this morning on my way, to, just went out to my car, pulled this out, it took me 60 seconds to drill two holes in it, really easy. When you drop the funnel into it, you want to have funnels that have got a bit of a lip on them because you want to glue it, and if they've got no lip, they just go pop, and they drop right through, which is nowhere near as much good. So I drop it in, and I haven't glued this one in, but um, uh, uh, some people use silicon sealant. I find that a little bit too flexible, and it makes them a little bit prone to, to come loose, uh, but you can get all sorts of glues that you do it in. Once you've glued it in there, so there's your funnel trap. So that's five dollars for the box, a dollar for the funnel times two, that's six dollars, seven dollars maybe, a bit of glue, not very much. Um, and the trap can be used over and over and over and over again. You can get bigger boxes which might seem better because you get more tadpoles. Well, maybe. You've got to pick the damn thing up when it's full of water and that's hard because you have to tip the tadpoles out to catch them. Um, so uh, my advice would be to go for more smaller traps rather than fewer gigantic traps. After all, it's a tadpole for goodness sake, it's not a dog. All right, so, so it's only this big uh, and you're not going to get 12 billion of them in one trap. You, we've had catches up to 10,000 in a trap, um, but not beyond that. So um, uh, smaller ones. The other thing is that um, the depth of the water in the water bodies you might be catching in or want to catch in may be variable, so you're better off with a slightly taller box with the hole cut towards the bottom because it doesn't matter really where the, the hole is, the funnel is, it can be anywhere in the water column as long as it's underwater. The top of the box sits above the water. If you take a short box like this, yeah, it's a bit easier to use um, and it fits, I put a slightly smaller funnel and that fits into there. But if that stands in water that's any deeper than that, I can't do it because it goes over the top. It has to sit above the, the top has to be sitting above the water. So um, slightly taller boxes are probably better. If you go for the gigantic boxes, you have to be Hercules to pick them up and empty them out at the end or run around with a little dab net and catch all the tadpoles. So that's pretty much all there is to making a trap. Um, we're now giving the baits away uh, through organisations that have signed on to our Cane Toad Challenge as affiliates. They've signed a memorandum of understanding with the University of Queensland. They've nominated a contact person who has signed a code of conduct. That allows us to operate under the animal ethics permits that I have with the University of Queensland. Um, all the liabilities are properly apportioned 
If you eat the baits, it's not our fault. We tell you probably best not to eat the baits. Do not give them to your dog. Do not give them to your kids. And don't suck on them yourself. Um, so what does it look like when you actually use it? Here's a trap. So what happened here was um, early on in the piece, um, we hadn't really set up the cane toad challenge at that time. Uh, we were... Um, what well, we had sort of made some noises and people knew what we were doing and a environmental officer for the Moreton Bay Regional Council was approached by um, some people from the Bribery Island Environmental Protection Association uh, which is a local um, wildlife um, uh, volunteer group and they said they're revegetating a creek and it's absolutely swarming with tadpoles and they were right this is the tadpoles in their creek and they said they are just horrified what can we do? So Clinton came to see me and he phoned me up and he says, any chance that we could do something with that bait stuff that you're working with? I said, you're sure, come on in. So he came in on a whiteboard. I said, this is how you make a trap. It took about two minutes. He said, yeah, got it, feed it, it's not too hard. Off he went, made himself a trap. Here's his trap, stood it on the bottom. There's the funnel on the side. And we're still sort of fiddling around about, you know, what is the optimum length of time to leave the trap? And so, um, uh, I said to Clinton, set the trap in the morning, go away, come back at 5 o'clock, go have lunch, go have a beer, go to wherever you have to do, um, come back eight hours later and see what you've caught. Now somewhere in the translation, uh, Clinton misunderstood those instructions and he thought, set the trap, wait 10 minutes and have a look. Um, and so this is Clinton putting the trap in the water, putting the bait in, stepping back and pulling out his camera, waiting 10 minutes and then filming. So. It's, the trap is not full of tadpoles at this stage. That would be amazing, uh, 10 minutes. Um, but I think you'll agree that he did capture um, a change in behaviour. Whoops, hang on a sec. So this is a, a video clip. So let's see if it works. So in the previous slide, the tadpoles were all facing in random directions because there was no reason to point north, south, east, west, whatever. Um, I, I suggest you have a look at the direction the tadpoles are facing when he pans back. And even the ones on the bottom have reoriented with their tails pointing away, their heads pointing towards the box. So he thought that was really cool. He waited there and he watched them all swim in. And a couple of hours later, he had six and a half thousand tadpoles in his box. Um, and then he put the same bait back in um, three more times and put another couple of thousand, another thousand. And then uh, he left it overnight and vandals destroyed it. So, so uh, one of the challenges of working, I guess, in the uh, um, uh, community. Uh, if you're wondering why there's a log on top, uh, that was to stop it floating away. So, um, a very um, high-tech solution. Okay, so of course Clinton is an environmental officer, so he's smart because he's got a degree uh, and he knows how to make a trap properly and he knows how to put it in the, in the water properly. So the next person who approached me was um, Daryl, the retired carpenter from Redlands. And Daryl phoned me up and says, oh my God, I've got cane toads all over the place. I've heard you've got something going can I do something? And I, we got him and his wife into my office and gave them the same spiel as I gave Clinton. And Daryl went away and said, yeah, I'm a carpenter. I know how to hold a drill. I can cut a hole in a box, no worries. And he went away and he made his own traps. And we gave him two baits. He didn't have a lot at that stage. And uh, he used those baits and he had a good old time. And he reported back to us. He said it worked wonderfully. And so we got the University of, of uh, Queensland's uh, um, media unit to send a film crew out and interview Daryl um, and make a short video about what he did. And they came into the lab, which was great, and, and, and explained what we did. So I'm just going to play you the video clip. Uh, some of what's in there you would have already heard from me, um, but um, just bear with that until you get to Daryl, because he's the important person. Here's 
Daryl Strap. So um, the next step was to try to get, yeah. So what do you do with the tadpoles? Ah, good question. So um, uh, bag them and put them in the bin. Um, Sorry? Bag them and put them in the bin. Um, they are toxic. Um, uh, I, I mentioned that the later stage tadpoles are a little less toxic, but you don't know what stage tadpole you're dealing with, so the best thing is don't leave it lying around. Um, they're they're nowhere near as robust as an adult toad. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to kill an adult toad in the brutal way, um, but they're like a football. They just, they just take the pounding and they do nothing. Um, uh, just amazing the sort of damage they can take. The, the tadpoles, on the other hand, you take them out of the water and they're almost ready to cark it. So by the time you've filtered them through the shade cloth, for example, that's one way. You put the shade cloth down, you pour the water from the, the trap through the shade cloth, you tip it up, and then you tip them into a plastic bag and you're ready to go. If you're at all worried about it, you can cool them and freeze them the same as you would do to the adult toad. Um, but the sort of advice I'm getting from people who are doing it, they're dead before you get around to doing that, so it's sort of moot. Um, but yeah, that's how you get rid of them. So. Uh, that was all great, but it's still word of mouth that we needed to get um, better um, visibility. Uh, we, when we published the original science back in 2012, just before we published it, we patented it, or we applied for a patent. The patent took five years to be granted. It was granted just this year. And there was nothing wrong at any stage of the process. It just took five damn years uh, to get the patent. Um, we licensed the patent to a company last year, even though we hadn't got the full patent, which was a bit cheeky, but nevertheless, they, they bought it and they paid all their patent costs and they are now um, uh, commercialising the technology to make a trap that you can buy in the shops and the bait that you can buy in the shops. The problem with that is that we waited, it took us from 2012 to 2017 to find a partner who would, uh, or even 2016, to find a partner who would commercialise it. Four or five years. During which time, we weren't doing anything. 
We knew we had a solution, but we couldn't do anything with it. Then when we did license it, um, the partner came back and said, well, that's great. We hope to have a product on the market sometime in three to five years. And we're going, my goodness gracious, you know. Meanwhile, the toads are all over the place. So uh, um, approached the partner, and the industry partner, and said, look, um, do you mind if we, give the ba we make the baits in the lab and we give them away to the public for free so that they can use them to catch tadpoles and do good stuff and then when there's a commercial product, we'll stop giving it away from free and we'll point them to the shops and they can buy it. And they said, that's a great idea. Knock yourself out because they're not losing any money because they're not selling anything yet. Haven't even got a product. Um, so uh, I created the Cane Toad Challenge as a branding uh, and with some support from um, uh, the university media offices and place like that. We got some graphic works done up with a little bit of a sort of logo at the top there and we started to get ourselves heard. We set up a website and then I started to figure out how to give baits away. Well, I thought it was going to be as simple. Members of the public like Daryl would phone me up and I'd arrange for them to come in and take some baits. Little did I know um, that I had a year and a half of administration to get through before I could give a single bait away. So if you phone me up, I can't give you any baits. So I've got baits here today. I can't give a single bait to a, to a member of the public. I can only, we eventually could only do it through affiliates, which is an organisation with an ABN who sign an agreement with the University of Queensland, a memorandum of understanding. This essentially allows the University of Queensland off the hook for any liability. If I give the baits to Daryl, they were a bit upset about that. They sent their film crew there to film him and then promptly told me off for it uh, because if Daryl had swallowed the bait, the university would have been in trouble. And now, I didn't expect Daryl to eat the bait. I thought he was probably smart enough to figure that's not what you do. Um, but the truth is you just can't be sure when you give the baits out willy-nilly to all manner of people. So I understand that. So we started out with the intention to give the baits to the public as members. People could come onto our website and register as members, but that quickly disappeared in a hail of administration and legalese. Uh, then we decided we'd give it to affiliates, and then suddenly I had to prove um, uh, all sorts of things about animal ethics. I had to sort out how you kill tadpoles. I had to sort out um, uh, uh, codes of conduct, uh, all sorts of other things. So, so it went on for the best part of a year, and it was only in around about November, December last year that I actually had all the paperwork in place and we could actually start to give these baits away. And over the last three to four months, we've given away probably over 5,000 of them now. There's only 25 to a bottle, so we're pumping them out of the lab as fast as we can. We make them out of dead toads. So organisations are going out, getting rid of toads, picking up the adult toads. What we say is, don't put them in landfill and don't give us the dead toad. Um, find someone to chop off the glands for you and give us the glands. So 600 dead toads turns into a lunchbox of glands. We now have a, a uh, one of our donors generously gave us $5,000 to go and buy a super deluxe stainless steel smoothie maker, which is a sort of a giant, giant toad smoothie machine for the lab. And we will pour in all of these glands and whack it up to full, step back and there's the glands just churning around. It's fantastic. Um, and from that, it takes a few days for us to get the chemistry out, let the enzyme do its job, and then we um, uh, have a pipette and we pipette them out onto, um, onto the air stones and let them dry. We'd dearly love to, to get away from the air stones and develop a slow release, a <coughs> dissolvable natural wax way of doing it, because that's the smart way to do it. That way you'd get one bait and you'd put it in the water, and as long as there's a bait on the end of the string, a bit like a toilet duck or something like that, it would always be releasing. Um, but we haven't got the research dollars to be able to do that work. So at the moment, it's just the air stone. Yeah. So these baits keep up in mind, how long will one those work for? A day. So basically one use. Put them in, uh, uh, and, and the, the chemistry, within 48 hours, the chemistry is more or less uh, gone. How close are you to um, isolating the individual components and judging their toxic health and We know we've already done it. Oh, so I thought you were just taking the No, we, we've already purified every single chemical, 
characterise and identify every single chemical. When we're making our baits though, we have to be mindful of cost. So it is actually not necessary for us to make a single pure chemical because there are five chemicals that all have the same effect and we know how to um, quickly get all five of those into one simple preparation. So we have um, standards that we use to check to see that the blend is what it's supposed to be um, because ultimately we're giving it away. So if we generate a pure compound, the cost goes up probably 50 to 100 fold and we can't do that. And it's not necessary anyway because it's, uh, uh, we're mimicking the natural system and the natural system is not doing it with a single chemical. So, oh my God, everybody, yeah. The down into New South Wales, they're across the whole of Queensland's uh, coastal areas, right across the Northern Territory into Western Australia. So, so they, they're still entering virgin territory. Uh, and it's a different problem over there because it's a very remote area. The solution that we've got can be used by people in managed waterways. But if you're in a remote place, no one's running around with a whole bunch of traps to catch tadpoles. So we don't want to make it seem as if this is the panacea. This is not going to get rid of cane toads in Australia. It's going to help you get rid of them at the golf course. It's going to get rid of them in the town water uh, features. It's going to get them around farmers' dams, you know, which is good enough, getting, getting rid of them from a whole range of, of locations. Um, and uh, picking up the adult toads is still valid, but now if it's done in combination with trapping the tadpoles, you've got a better chance of having a, a drop in the population. That's the plan. Does it work? Well, I mean, you can theorise these things to the cows come home, but you've really just got to run it. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the baits out there. Some of the organisations we're dealing with are just farmers who just want to get them out of their dam. So in terms of science, they don't care. The tadpoles are gone, that's great. Others are taking a much more scientifically minded approach. The Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service is one of our partners. They want to run very specific trials. They want to have um, standardised reporting. They want to have a whole pile of things. We've got an environmental consultant company called EcoShore. They've got contracts with all sorts of people to get rid of uh, cane toads, including the tadpoles. Uh, one of their guys came to see me the other day with some fresh glands, gave him another 100 uh, uh, baits, asked him how he's going. He said uh, they've caught a half a million so far, uh, and they're still just trying to get their head around how to do it. So look, we set up the cane toad challenge. That got us a little bit more notoriety. Middle of last year, um, ABC Landline came and did a program. We thought they were going to do a, a five minute sort of, um, sort of puff piece, which is sort of what you expect. Uh, they didn't, they ended up doing a uh, uh, 25 minute uh, program. Um, when they put it up, I was overseas at the time, uh, they put a, 40 second, a 41 second promo up three days before the program went to air. In the three days before the program went to air, that was viewed 395,000 times. They were really rocked. <laughs> if you go back, because they keep all of their stats for all their things. This is not the best, it's not the worst. It's, it's one of the best they've had. And at the time, it was about number three that year. Um, so people really warmed to it. If you get a chance to watch it, it's a bit of fun. Uh, they went out, they, I introduced them to a pastoralist with a cattle station to talk about their, their, their um, dung beetles, uh, to a lettuce farmer who had a, a biosecurity problem because the little cane toads were getting into his lettuce and were turning up in Melbourne, um, and then he would get a fine. Um, and these days when you go to the supermarkets, apparently nobody knows how to chop up a lettuce these days, so you've got to buy them in plastic bags. Um, with all the different leafy vegetables tossed in together because, God forbid, you should actually buy separate ones and toss them together yourself. Um, so there's a huge industry of, and so what he was telling me, that their plant, they bring the leafy vegetables in, of the different species, and blend them to make their particular product, and they all go into giant wash tanks and they all get washed, and they go through a conveyor belt and they come out, and then they go into uh, bags and eventually they find their way to the shelves in the supermarket. If somebody notices a toad anywhere in the production line, they're by law required to shut down the plant, throw away all the product in the production line, clean it, sterilise it, notify all of the people that they sell product to that they had a toad in the system, and then restart the whole thing. One toad. 
Now, they don't like toads. <laughs> so, so, so it's not that it's killing anything. It's, it's killing their business. Uh, that's what it's doing. Um, and, of course, when the toad turns up in a, in a shipment of lettuce down at the clearinghouse down in Melbourne, they've now broken some federal law because they've moved a noxious animal from one jurisdiction to another and then it's a reportable offence and all sorts of things. So they employ people to run around the farm checking on toads and while they can see the big toads, they're pretty easy. When you get these swarms of the little toads, when the tadpoles all come out and you get like 5,000 things like grasshoppers heading off into your lettuce patch, big costs with big gaps between all the leaves. What are you going to go in and peer between every single leaf? It's a lot of work. So um, uh, the program picks up the concerns of people other than those who are just traditionally interested in native animals, which is good. Um, so um, just to give you a bit of timeline, the science was done before 2012. We, patent, we published it, but just before we published it, we did something a little bit unusual. We patented it. Um, uh, that was because I come from a background of making pharmaceuticals, so I know all about patenting, um, and figured that um, it didn't cost too much to take out the patent, and we wanted someone to spend several hundred thousand dollars putting a product. They weren't going to do that if the moment they got all the registration, anybody could come along and just make a Me Too product and start selling it. So um, we licensed it in 2016. In 2016, shortly after licensing, we set up the Cane Toad Challenge. It took five years to get the patent granted. Um, it was getting too slow to, to market, so we started to ship baits uh, just before Christmas. Um, and now we're still, we probably missed the peak of the, the tadpole season because I had to get, uh, uh, I've got 50 organisations signed on as Cane Toad Challenge affiliates. Um, and they range from Brisbane City Council as one um, member. So that includes their 200 community groups that they manage, so all now part of it by virtue of the umbrella signing on of Brisbane City Council. Logan City Council was the first council in Queensland to sign on. Ipswich is on, Tweed's on, Bundaberg's on, Rockhampton's on, um, Scenic Rim's on, and so on and so forth. So we're working our way through. But each of those takes time because you have to, you have a conversation with somebody at this height on the totem pole, and the person who signs off on the paperwork is multiple levels above them and it takes time for it to work its way up and then there's a question that comes all the way down and it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, Moreton Bay Regional Council was the first council that actually did trapping with Clinton and they still haven't signed on yet because they're still trying to negotiate changes to the MOU. Um, so hopefully they'll sign on very soon. So it took for almost forever to get everyone signed on. So next year we think is going to be the big, the big drive. Sorry. What was that? So I came tonight to listen to you, no, back, right. even though I've been researching it, but also to have a look at some of the results and find out maybe what we might have been doing wrong with our tracks. And it, I think it's possibly the design. Yeah. So I've learned some So there was a suggestion in the early days that we could probably simplify it by just drilling a hole and pushing a funnel in, which seemed a bit easier. But as the funnel moves away from the box, it makes it less effective. And that's what I think we've done wrong. Hopefully, if you if you start catching some tadpoles.
we caught over 900 cane toads in my figures are right over the season from September when we started to last month. We caught three in one night. We can make about 10 baits per adult. Right, so we've got... <laughs> so there's there's 9,000 baits. So, and we've caught a total of 66 in one little trap that we had with one mm. bait, um, where they've got some stream. We did get some guppies in there and some yabbies because they breed in that um, Gala Lake. Not that many, but um, 20 guppies in one. My husband thinks it may have been um, the pushing down into the water and then it sucked in. It got sucked in, in. Yeah, um, yeah. He's a scientist as well. Um, mm -hmm. He has a PhD in soil and soil and tissue issues. Not many of those. Yes, um, so we also think the one place we tried it, which was water that we had seen tilapia in, in a sediment pond, and I actually had photographed toad holes that just hatched and were still sitting on the leaf in long groups, but they weren't swimming yet. So I knew they had laid in there, and we often catch a lot of adult toads around that sediment pond. But we also have a list of huge amounts of tilapia in there, and the fishing public told me that that's the only animal that can eat. Is that correct? So I was approached by a Pacific, one of the Pacific Island nations because they have tilapia in their freshwater lakes on their island as a major food supply. Mm -hmm. And they were concerned because they were eating the toads and they weren't dying, which is good. But then the tilapia become poisonous and if it's in their food supply, then they were worried that they would be eating poisoned tilapia. So, so I had heard that the tilapia were able to um, eat eat the um, uh, the tadpoles. All right, so that's an interesting thing. So when we put the trap into that pond, even though we thought they were in there, we, I hadn't decided the it was quite dark, and I just said to my husband, I'll just wait one in there and see what we get. We got nothing, only guppies, but we know the tilapia were in there, and then we just recently did a classic normal pest fishing species day for the tilapia, and out of um, Spring Lake, we fished out the communities. Um, health, 250 fish of varying sizes and small ones that showed that they were actually breeding in LA. And the program of the perch that were actually put in and stocked originally in that lake was probably under 10. That's terrible. So the tilapia have eaten out um, uh, So there's got to be a silver lining in there. Well, <laughs> getting the toads. <laughs> And yes, we did get on Channel 7 News um, to promote uh, what we were doing. Yeah. And uh, we're the top predators at the moment. But we are um, duties at one of our members. And we are actually hearing more of the um, striped marsh frogs and sedge frogs when we go out. We're actually seeing more spiders on the ground at night time. We, do, we only do them once a month. Mm -hmm. But we've noted more spiders um, each month as well. So you probably won't know the impact environmentally on our ecology there, um, and maybe until next season, but we did um, get training through Hay Montgomery, um, who's an ecologist, to help teach us how to catch toads and how to you know, do the right thing. So that was all the gut of the crowd. Well, look, as, as I said, though, I think uh, picking up the adult toads uh, shouldn't be underestimated, um, and it's a question of coming up with lots of potential solutions yeah. And, and solutions that can apply in more remote areas. And I was at a working group in Darwin a year ago um, for the um, federal government uh, cane toad threat abatement plan. And five years earlier when they'd had one, everybody at the meeting was just uh, listing the species that were going extinct. That was the meeting. There was no plan to do anything. At the last one, it was incredibly satisfying because we had one idea, but ours was but one of 10. Um, and so if, even if one or two or three of those make it through, it's really interesting to see some of these other ideas that are working through. And some of them are focused at the invasion front where they see it as an opportunity to protect pristine areas. Very few of them were back in the sort of Brisbane, sort of in the Queensland area. In fact, I was a lone voice at that meeting saying that I think we should do something back in Queensland because they all said, the damage is done, why do you bother? because they're looking at the big lizards and the big snakes, they say they're all they've protected. I said, no, you've got a ground swell of people who hate toads. 
you've got to marshal them, you've got to empower them to get rid of the toads. When you have something there, that could actually translate into more resources for the invasion front. While you're in a low population area, very few people see the damage. So, so they don't, it doesn't get the same um, impact. And just for some statistics, we started off with about six or seven people that came after we put the event out. You know, we trained the scouts, that was the mm -hmm. first one, we trained the scouts, and that was the community engagement. And then we opened it up to the public, and we got seven people coming. Great people, great people. But then we, each month, we increased, and I think the last one was something like 25 scouts and 20 members of the public came. All local people, some come from different suburbs, and um, we're supplying with lots of toes. But uh, my husband, who does the dissecting, he loved to design a machine that would just get the gland out so he doesn't have to sit there with a very sharp knife and cut them out. He, he has still got 300 in the freezer to get right. done for him. But he's sort of, he, he has asked for volunteers, people like catching them, but nobody's putting their hand up to actually cut the glands out because that's a horrible job and no one's volunteered. So if you've got any feedback or if anyone want to volunteer to do that, you don't want to catch them, but you'd like to practice your skills and so someone told me the other day that uh, even if we didn't catch a single tadpole, the fact that we've got all people catching dead uh, toads for us to feed our, our production line probably means that more adult toads are disappearing into baits. So, so that's, a good, that's a good outcome too. Um, but look, if you want to know more, there's a website, Cane Toad Challenge, one word. Uh, from that you can click, I've now, as of today, put a list of all of the affiliates up there, so yours will be up there too, with a website, if I could find a website, um, so that you could go and see who that organisation is. And the reason for putting that is there is that members of the public are still keen, and my advice would be for them to go and find an affiliate in their area and make contact with them, rather than um, trying to get stuff out of me, which I can't do, because it's not legally, li uh, not legally allowed to do so. So look, um, it's probably everybody's really hot and it's almost the end of the evening, so here's, here's the thanks to the toad. If we didn't have a problem, I wouldn't be here tonight, so there you go. Um, so the, 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 the toads are our problem. Um, uh, I showed a picture of my lab and, and you probably saw on the video clip there me standing in the lab or at some stage. That's a bit of a, a um, media event because actually uh, I'm not a lab coat scientist, I'm a suit scientist, I sit in my office. Um, so these, I have young people who work for me, they actually make the baits and none of them are paid to do it. So right, they've all got their day job and so they make these things on their own time um, just the same as the public are out there volunteering, giving their time to use them. Um, they, they give their time to, do, uh, to make the baits. So Angela is our, uh, uh, is our king of our smoothie machine um, and uh, Venkat finished his PhD a, a while ago. He's now left us, so we're now down to Angela. Um, and uh, uh, Venkat was the guy who worked out about the enzyme and the toxin, um, which was a very important um, uh, thing for us to know about. And we couldn't have done any of that without the people who actually know what the toads are um, uh, and know their behaviour. And this is uh, Rick Shine who is probably, yes, yeah. So our, our khaki gentleman in the front here knows to bow to, to Rick. He is, he is the, uh, the guru of uh, cane toads in Australia. In fact, he recently sent me his latest book, uh, which is uh, on, on toads as well. So look, thanks very much for, for having me along. I hope you know a little bit more about the toads now. Um, we are not going to win the war um, this year, and we're probably not going to win it in a few years to come but at least I think there are more weapons at our disposal and ways to um, push back um, in certain places. So let's hope. Thanks very much.